Welcome to our fifth annual Asia Society at the Sundance Film Festival event and happy year of the rabbit. We're so pleased to be with you in person. Each year we do this event, we see more and more Asian representation and that just is so satisfying and gratifying for us. So thank you for being here to support us. Another milestone, Janet Yang. She has curated this event for the last four years. She can't be with us today because she's in the top job in film as the president of the um, Motion Picture Academy and she's working on Oscar nominations. So we are very proud of her and we miss her, Jan. We miss you, Janet. I'm Margaret Conley, the Executive Director of Asia Society in Northern California. I'm here with my team. We have Nina Udagawa over there, Angela Chung seated up front, and volunteer Mary Stone in the corner. We could not have done this event without our sponsors. We have Julia Gao, Josh Elks, and Southwest. Let's please thank them. Josh Elks at Harbor has been supporting us for five years. It was his entry to get us into Sundance and he's been a staunch supporter since, helping and encouraging us to make it bigger and bigger every year, including a lunch this year too. Thank you for that. So we actually had time to talk to each other. And Julia, last year, as we know, it was a virtual festival, so we didn't have a chance to meet the filmmakers, but Josh had the idea to host an in-person dinner, which we did in Los Angeles, so we got to meet the filmmakers, and Julia sponsored that, and that was very special to us. So please, thank our sponsors again. A big thank you also to Sundance, to Jeannie and Doug, your team is fantastic to work with. We are so happy to be back here for a fifth consecutive year. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I now like to welcome to the stage Senator Karen Kwan from Utah's District 12. She was just elected to the Senate. She has been in the legislature for since 2016. She is the first Chinese American in Utah in office. She is a descendant of the of a railroad Builder. She's the president of the Chinese Railroad Workers Descendants Association. She has been advocating for Asian American voices to be heard and their stories to be preserved. So it's fitting for her to be here with us at Sundance. Please welcome Senator Karen Kwan. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I, I had a speech and then we had a tragedy and I changed it. So we're gonna see what happens today. But first of all, I do wanna thank you. Uh, thank, thank you to, the, uh, to Margaret and to the uh, uh, Asia Society of Northern California and to Sundance and sponsors, of course. Uh, to the community members, filmmakers, artists, uh, all of you here, uh, and welcome to Utah. Um, it, it, Utah has a vibrant and diverse Asian American community. The Chinese American community, oh, I, I need to, to correct something in my, my bio. I'm not the first Chinese elected. I'm the very first Chinese uh, American legislature, legislator, uh, which means it, it didn't occur to me until um, maybe while I was on the floor of that first day of the, of the uh, Senate, which was, I don't know, Tuesday, uh, that I'm also the very first Chinese American senator. So rep and senator. So anyways, uh, you guys are great. You guys are wonderful. Um, let's see, I'm going back to my notes here. Uh, let's see. Uh, well, uh, we have this long history here, Chinese Americans and Asian Americans, in building Utah, uh, most particularly the Transcontinental Railroad. And one of the great things that has occurred uh, just in these last couple of years is that there is a town, a railroad town called Terrace, Utah, and it's way out the, in the middle of nowhere, the West Desert, it takes about three hours to get there, nothing around around there, no amenities, right? No bathroom, <laughs> right? But it is a one of the largest railroad towns that uh, was along the, uh, uh, the railroad grade. Uh, we have recently, just last year, uh, our state archeologists along with uh, our state uh, 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 managers for, uh, with BLM, um, uh, uncovered um, and archaeologically uh, uh, dug right, the very first time in history 
a Chinese railroad worker home. Yes, and they have uncovered thousands of artifacts. Uh, they, it, it was maybe a week-long dig, came back with 20, 30 boxes. It's going to take us a while to get through there to kind of learn what this means, but we are able to now see uh, some uh, of the daily lives of my ancestor. So this is something that I am very uh, proud of and, and, and interested in. Um, I, I do, uh, of course, uh, a Happy New Year and want to wish your families and, and yourselves a healthy, wealthy, and peaceful Lunar New Year. Uh, but today, apologies. Today is no ordinary beginning of Lunar New Year with the tragedy and devastation that occurred in Monterey Park, California. Many of you are from California, I would assume. My dad, my 92-year-old father is there in El Monte, which is very close. If you don't know, it's very close to Monterey, California. He could have been there. Could have been anywhere, actually. So many of us were at celebrations last night. It's times like this that we think about how important it is for us to remind the world that state lines do not define our communities. State lines do not put boundaries on our communities. We have, as I said, many of you are from California, we have friends or we have family there, but at moments like this, we are all comma Ina family. I, I hope that um, this is an okay time and that it is appropriate, Margaret, with your permission to have a moment of silence. And so, uh, please. Thank you all. I spoke to the president of the Senate this morning, uh, President Stuart Ad Adams, uh, and he uh, wanted to make sure that uh, you, you uh, that he offered uh, not only his condolences, but on behalf of the entire Senate, uh, the, the condolences, deep condolences to our entire communities. This is a message. We do not know the motives, but it sure sends a message to our communities. With the rise of anti-Asian violence that has occurred, our recourse now is to hug our families tighter. It's to also support one another as we stand together and to live our lives unafraid as we fight against this violence. I thank you all. I look forward to the panel. Happy New Year, everybody. Thank you very much, Senator Quan, for those touching remarks and for that tribute and for everything that you do for the Asian community here and across the country. We do have, yes, let's hear it for her again. We are featuring five films and many of them do revolve around family and home and community. So that theme will continue throughout today. We have two panels. One is going to feature two features and the second panel will feature three shorts. We have clips of a few of them. There will be time for Q&A, so do have your questions ready. The bios of all our filmmakers, their amazing backgrounds are on our Asia Society Northern California website. To get us started, let's go ahead and play a highlight clip of the five films we'll be featuring today. If we can please welcome to the stage, we're featuring two features from the documentary Om, The Cult at the End of the World, with producer Chiaki Inajimoto. 
And from the next category, Fremont actor Anaita Walizada. Thank you. Oh, great. So, how many people have seen Ohm and Fremont in the room? They were very, very hard tickets to get. They were sold out, both screenings, in the last couple of days. So congratulations on making it very difficult for us to get tickets. So both of your films, and you can go ahead and yeah, flip it up a little and it'll go on. Um, they cover very tough subject matter. One is a documentary that feels like it really should be fiction. And the other is a noir, a love story, and it's fictional, but it also deals with a very real life trauma. Uh, and I'd like to start with Chiaki, your film about a cult leader that leads to murder, that leads to sarin and poison attacks in Tokyo. Um, can you tell us about your film? Uh, sure, um, thanks for having me here today. Um, so our film is called Om, the Cult at the End of the World, and it is about this uh, religious group called Om Shinrikyo, who started as a small yoga group in Tokyo in the late 90s. In 10 years of time, they conducted a horrible, uh, horrifying chemical gas attack in the subway of Tokyo uh, in, the 19, in 1995. And it is not just about the subway attack, but it is really about what led up to that event, uh, what was going on in the world in Japan with these, with these people, who are these people, um, how it even happened. And uh, um, it is a story that's gripping, and you know, it, hopefully it, show, it sheds the lights on um, people who were fighting and who were alarming about this, this cult um, way before the subway attack. And why did you want to do it? Um, so I'm from Japan, and I grew up in a place called Yamanashi, uh, where this cult's largest headquarter was. And uh, when the subway attack happened, um, it was, I was in middle school, and uh, I was, you know, of course, a big shock to the entire nation, um, but of course to the community in Yamanashi. And I remember my parents telling me to be careful of these people uh, in the mountains uh, in white robes. So that memory was really vivid for me. And uh, it is a story that you know stayed with me. And since I came to California, um, I started making uh, films. I started producing films. And uh, when I uh, met with my uh, co-director Ben Brown, who's in the uh, audience tonight uh, today, um, when I met him and we started talking about Duck World, and we both have producing background, and uh, you know we were talking about how um, the Duck World in Japan there hasn't you know been stories there hasn't been great docs uh, that's based on the story driven you know but there are great story, great docs about culture and, and you know traditions but uh, what is the story that needs to be told uh, from Japan and we started talking about Ohm and uh, from very early on it was pretty clear that that's the story uh, that needs to be told. And it was a difficult one to do and we'll get into that a little bit later um, but you have access to incredible archival footage and we have a short clip to share with you here too. So for anyone who's spent time in Japan or worked there, it's very hard to get access to footage like this. Chiaki, how did you do it? Yeah, so what you just saw is uh, before the subway attack, basically in 1991, uh, they were on media a lot and um, you know on the talk show, popular TV show, variety shows. And uh, going back to the archive footage, uh, we have several categories of archive footage that we were able to have in the film. Uh, one was own produced uh, uh, footage publications. Uh, the other was uh, news footage or the, the footage that was on media um, and uh, on you know, uh, for public. And uh, <clears throat> for the you know uh, for the for the footage that we see on media and especially the footage that we saw. Um, about the subway attack or the, what the cult was doing. You know, there were a lot of Japanese broadcasters who put those on media at that time. Uh, we had a very hard time uh, negotiating with them to release the materials. Uh, we sometimes, oftentimes, we had to um, go out to other sources like BBC or, you know, outside of Japan, like broadcasters outside of Japan to to get the rights of the same footage because the Japanese broadcasters 
basically didn't want to show that they were showing this um, uh, on media. So, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't the uh, you know easiest task to get all these archives, but uh, we had a great team, um, and uh, yeah, we were able to put together a lot of a lot of materials, uh, archive materials in the film. We'll come back to that. Anita, let's go to Fremont. We saw the premiere tonight again, totally sold out. Uh, well, the second screening was last night, premiere totally sold out. It's a film about an Afghan translator working at a fortune cookie factory uh, in San Francisco. And the character lives in Fremont, and most people here in the Bay Area know Fremont. It's about 40 minutes from San Francisco, depending on traffic for the day. Uh, <laughs> And it has, Fremont has the largest population of Afghans in the world. There are about 30,000 of them in the community. So I know that was important to the film. But Anita, why don't you tell us in your words what the film is about? Uh, thank you so much for having me today. Uh, movie, um, our film, uh, Fremont, is about an Afghan translator, Afghan woman translator. She left Afghanistan uh, in uh, August 2021. Uh, and one of the evacuation flights, and she came to to the United States, and um, she started her life. So she has problem with her past, and she's trying to uh, solve it. Um, yeah, the movie is about an Afghan girl, a young woman adjusting to life in America, and also a, you know self discovery as well for her. Um, why was it important for you to play this role? First of all, uh, because this movie and this film is uh, about Afghanistan, and I'm from Afghanistan, and all of us know about Afghanistan, what's going on there, and what happened for us, uh, me as a woman, and all of us, we worked hard for 20 years to change the idea of Talibanism and ch to change the idea of uh, not having right for a woman or um, Having our rights, like as a human, having rights, going to school, having education, and uh, wear what, do, what we want to wear, like not black and white. We are just black and white in Afghanistan, my people. So I wanted to start again because I lost everything. I was journalist in Afghanistan. I worked for three years uh, from uh, when I was 19 years old. I started working as a journalist. Uh, and. It was my uh, my last year of uh, university, but I couldn't make it and I couldn't graduate. So now I'm here. I have to start again and go to college, learn language. And so that was an opportunity to be a voice of woman of Afghanistan and start again. So I started. Well, I would say you're doing a very good job. Thank you so much. How did how did the crew find you or how did you find them? Um, my friend, AJ Sobat, uh, he was the one who helped me to get out of Afghanistan. Uh, he sent me an email. It was about the movie, and I just read the description. It was like an uh, Afghan translator. She lives in Fremont, and I just uh, sent an email to Babak, and he uh, get me back, and we had the two Zoom call, and after that, uh, I went to California, and we started shooting the, our film. Babak is the director, of course. So you just email the director. Yes. <laughs> Great. And we have a clip to share with you, too. Thank you. Go ahead. Well, you can see from the tone of that, and I heard you say this at the screening yesterday, that your character is very calm, even though there's so much going on underneath. But can you, for the people who haven't seen the film, talk about the calmness of the character and the direction that you got? Um, the, this part, uh, she doesn't want to share her past because, uh, or she doesn't want to hear, she doesn't want to share her thoughts with people, even with the psychiatrist. So uh, our director, Babak, he was uh, like, uh, he wants me to be quiet and uh, send a lot to the people. So it was like that. Yes, this character is also a little bit of a rebel, um, and she, there's, a, there's a secret message in a fortune cookie that you have to watch the film to figure out what happens next. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, for both of you, you're telling stories about countries that you also 
consider home. Japan, Afghanistan, both places where you still have family. But these films could not have been made in those countries. And I'm wondering, Chiaki, if you could address that. Sure. Um, I think it connects largely to why I wanted to make this film. Um, because it is a, you know, a part of the history that we have a hard time facing as Japanese community, uh, we have a hard time expressing, and uh, it's not the history that we're the most, you know, the, the proudest of. Um, and, you know, there's a, in Japan, there's a saying that if it stinks, put a lid on it. So, you know, if it's a, you know, something that we're shameful of or something that we'd rather not look back to, we just not, don't talk about it. And I think that culture uh, is largely, you know, uh, why it hasn't been told, especially outside of Japan. Um, you know, it just, just didn't really travel outside of Japan. So I think some of you might know about the subway attack, but, you know, when I talk to a lot of people in the States, you know, they don't really know, like, who, like, who, who were these people or what they were doing, uh, which is pretty horrifying. Um, and uh, so I think, you know, in Japan, for, for many reasons, but I think that's the biggest reason why it hasn't, it cannot be made in Japan, you know, the, it's not that we're not brave enough to talk about it, it's just that it's just sort of like a taboo to talk about this um, horrifying uh, piece of history. And, you know, the, the group still, I mean, spoiler, but the group still sort of exists um, and continues to grow. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's something that we just don't talk about um, in Japan. And so I think, you know, having, um, uh, me and my co-director, who's not who, do, who don't live in Japan, I think um, it was an important part um, to tell this story from a sort of outside perspective, but also with the understanding of what was going on in Japan at that time. And Anita, uh, for forty years there's war, and we read uh, and we saw the news. Uh, I didn't want to come here. I'm, uh, I'm saying that. I didn't want to come here because we had a lot of hope and we worked for it for 20 years. We had a little bit peace and we uh, understand what was that. Like I, we, I felt it. How, how was that? Uh, so now there's not any peace. There's Taliban. They don't want women go outside with a... Um, or alone or without uh, covering her face. So uh, it wasn't possible there. And it's a good idea to have movie here and shoot it here because uh, we have to know what's, uh, what's uh, inside here and with the Afghan people, what's going on with them. Because, OK, we came here after that. What's, what, what will happen? Because it's about the paperwork. It's about the. Um, make a company sitting with people, knowing them, and um, yeah. Let's talk about the eccentric characters that are in both of these films. Um, Chiaki, from Ohm himself, the cult leader, and the spokesperson, Joe Yu. Tell us about some of them, and we'll go to Fremont next. Sure. Um, so. I guess not everybody has seen the film, uh, so I, I wouldn't, uh, I, I try, I'll try not to say too much, but you know, when we uh, started developing this story or developing this film and looking at the story from multiple perspective, I think um, you know, it was important to have a sort of insider perspective who can tell us what was really going on inside the group at that time. The leader of the group, um, as, long as, uh, as well as 12 other high disciples, have been executed in 2018. So they don't uh, live on this planet. And one of the high disciples um, who survived, um, his name is Joe Yu, and we um, had access to him and uh, we interviewed. And I really don't want to say too much because it's going to be, you know, it, it will all make sense when you watch the film. Um, but he is a significant, significant character. Um, in the story, and it was important for us to um, have um, his story, not necessarily his point of view or perspective, but you know, it was important to really know what was actually going on and why people even joined this group. Yeah, it's really extraordinary that you again got access to the footage and to these personalities. 
definitely go see this film. And Anaida, you have eccentric characters throughout. Your uh, factory worker bosses, your doctor therapist. Do you want to talk about working with some of them and what that was like? Uh, working with the uh, with Greg uh, or psychiatrist Dr. Anthony. Uh, first of all, we if we met like we met each other. Um, he was trying to get something from me and to get then give me the sleeping pills. Um, he's really funny. His character in, uh, is, is really funny in the movie and uh, about the boss. Uh, He's very kind and supportive after she uh, she did a mistake and uh, after she made a mistake. So he's a supportive man and kind. And her his wife is uh, like everyone will saw what happened in the movie. I'm not gonna talk about it more because it's gonna be the, uh, make you tired. And the sense of humor, there's definitely some witty humor throughout this film, which was quite unexpected from the description, I must say. Um, the role of media and journalism. Um, Kiaki, you question the media in this film and whether or not journalists in Japan or elsewhere could have done more, although you do have a journalist at the central, as a central um, storyteller throughout, but do you want to comment on that? Sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think the important part of this story, of, of this phenomena, um, is, again, what led up to the event. And uh, not many people know that there were a lot of journalists and lawyers and local people, parents of the followers who are fighting with this group and who are alarming, uh, who are speaking out, uh, sometimes with the risk of being you know, harmed. And uh, I would like to point out that um, there's a one significant character in the story who's uh, one of the bravest journalists and one of the most renowned journalists in Japan. Uh, Miss Shoko Egawa is actually in the audience today. She f flew from Japan. Um, please stand, please stand. <laughs> Welcome. And, you know, again, as you watch the film, you will see her story uh, who, you know, she was one of the important voices who was trying to alarm the society what was actually going on. It's not the group who you see on the media. And, you know, I, I don't want to keep talking because I feel like I'm going to spoil the film for everybody. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it is, journalism is really the central of this story because it, it is, and it, it is very relevant um, to, uh, to today. And, uh, yeah, we have many journalists in the film. Thank you for that. And I'm going to go to audience Q&A after this because I'm realizing we don't have any minutes left. But um, Anaida, you were a journalist before you came to the US. Can you talk about that experience? That is not an easy profession to have in Afghanistan. Uh, it, was not be, it was not easy to go to the television and um, have a makeup. It was not easy. Or read the news. It was not easy. Like for me. Uh, some point it was easy because my sister she fight for it. She was she's a journalist. She was a journalist. She came here, but she, now she's in New York Film Academy. Uh, she fight for it for all of us, for my siblings, to go to school and have a job and go to the university. So for me, it kind of was easy. But inside the ha house, outside, it was not easy. Going outside, walking in the street, having a camera with yourself. Sometimes the the like saying something to you not uh, feels uh, it makes you feel bad because you are trying to give them information you're trying to give them um, a way of b living better but it's it was not easy even when I was in the, our office uh, because of my um, my language because of my uh, gender. Sometimes they didn't give me what I deserved. It. As like, uh, I had a car show. It was about the old um, car, and I had a show about it was about the old cars. So I tried a lot to give uh, to have a car from a man, but because I was a woman, he didn't give it me. I tried other way. Uh, from one of my colleagues, he was a man. He he he, he did it. And he get it, and so I'm trying my best to give you more information about Afghanistan, but I'm sorry about my English. No, you're doing a terrific job. Please, thank you very much. Yes. 
Do we have any questions from the audience? And we do have uh, more filmmakers from both of these films in the audience, so they can feel free to answer any questions as well. Any audience questions? I know it's hard if you haven't seen the film, but there's a question in the back. So the question was challenges and lessons. Yeah, I can start. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, it might be an obvious um, answer for a lot of filmmakers who are here, um, you know, this year, but the pandemic really, you know, stalled our production. When we started talking about the project, it was 2019. Uh, we did a preliminary research trip um, at the end of 2019 and the beginning of 2020. We promised all the subjects in Japan and who people who were trying to help us that we will come back in April. Of course, the world shut down. So it was a challenge to sort of ha keep them committed to our project. Um, and we kept promising that we will come back and we'll come back. And we eventually did um, in uh, last year and uh, you know put together everything. Uh, but that gave us time to really think about, you know, hone in on like what is the story here. And uh, <clears throat> eventually it worked out, uh, it worked itself out. But, you know, that, f that was of course the challenge. And, and also, I guess, personally, you know, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, having this vivid memory of, um, you know, at, of the incident at that time. And of course, Joe Yu, who was on TV a lot at that time, um, you know, facing those characters, uh, getting the stories and, you know, being in, like, sort of the reliving that moment, um, I guess uh, it is, uh, it was a, you know, personal challenge for me as well. And you had to travel to Japan to get footage that your colleagues couldn't do, right? That was also pandemic related? Yeah, so I have a Japanese citizenship, so I could uh, go back once the, you know, the, the restriction kind of eased. Um, I went back first in March 2022 to do a uh, few of the re uh, interview, key interviews and uh, research. And then in August, uh, I went back with my co-director, Ben, and uh, did more uh, interviews. And uh, But in 2020, when I went back in February to get materials or do research, uh, we were able to get a lot of um, materials um, that were related to OM that were produced by OM. Uh, so we, I eventually just came back with a lot of footage um, at that time. So we had time to digitalize, digitize everything. You know, our editor uh, who's here, Keita Ideno, brilliant editor, uh, poor Keta had to go through hours of hours of you know, footage uh, from the, from the group, um, but yeah, it, it, pandemic kind of gave us that time to really look at every material and really you know find out what is the story here. And I think eventually that gave us the film that we, uh, that we have. So it, it worked itself out. You're very strong because you're dealing with the global pandemic, and then also watching all this video of a very tense, dark topic of a cult psychologically, that's very challenging. So congratulations again on getting that done. Thank you. Anaida, any um, tips that you have or lessons learned from the question in the audience? Um, from the film, right? Yes. Uh, yes, the big lessons I learned uh, was uh, to not be weak, not be silent. Even uh, if you saw, the, if you see the movie, there's a one part she's silent all the time. She's quiet, but one part she stands for her right and um, screaming, screaming to someone who doesn't uh, respect her because she has a respect to him. So I listened to. Uh, I learned that I have to be um, strong for my generation for myself first for myself first then my, for my generation and my sister uh, my afghan woman those are in an, um, afghanistan and they are uh, banded from the employment education uh, having a right of uh, uh, sing a song or going outside without a man and all these um, even a little girl she has so many uh, depression she cried for that she can go to school so it's hard to see that video or it's hard to learn about it 
the best ways uh, to talk about them, to have a thought in our mind, to have a like a conversation about them, and don't forget about Afghanistan. That's the perfect way to end. Thank you very much, Chiaki and Anaida, and congratulations on your films. Uh, thank, thank you, you so you. much. Thank you. Be sure to take your Sundance water bottle. Oh, we're going to do a photo here. We're going to do a quick photo. And get ready for panel two. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's hear it for them again. Amazing work, amazing work. OK, for our second panel, we are featuring three shorts with Kyla Abuda Galang from When You Left Me On That Boulevard. Woo! <laughs> from Liz Sargent, Take Me Home, at the end there. And Shalini Adnani from White Ant. All of them, yes, welcome all of them. They're all screenwriters and directors. Did you get all directors as well? I want to make sure I get that part in too. <laughs> oh yes, these Sundance water bottles. I love these. <laughs> Thank you very much. And the volunteers at Sundance, can we give them a round of applause? They're so positive and helpful. So how many of you have seen any of these shorts? It was short program three. Again, hard to get tickets. Okay, we have a few people in the audience. That's wonderful. All of them have themes of coming home to multi-generational families, and it's appropriate as we celebrate Lunar New Year here together. But if you could um, tell us about your film with the cultural background, I would appreciate it. And maybe we start with, um, let's start with Liz at the end. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, I'm Liz Sargent. Um, my film is called Take Me Home. Um, it's a very personal film about um, my, uh, it's a narrative short, um, but it, it's about a 30-year-old woman whose mother dies without a plan, a future caregiving plan. Um, she has an intellectual disability, and her sister has to come back home and sort of figure out the transition moment. Um, and, you know, on a sort of poetic way. It's like it's shot in my mother's home. Uh, it's sort of about the mother dying, going to the next place, her home, and Anna trying to find a home, and the sister coming back home. Um, and uh, it's in Orlando, um, and it has the two sisters are uh, Korean adoptees. And it was really important for me to cast them as Korean adoptees, but not talk about adoption at all. Um, uh, it's a visual thing. I think there's moments in there that add to like the texture of the world and the home. And I've been really thinking about the adoptee community as its own identity. Um, I think it's, you know, there were 200,000 Korean adoptees that came over in the 80s, um, probably about the same amount from China. And thinking about that as Asian history and American history too. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Shalini, White Ant. Um, yeah, so White Ant tells the story of a man who uh, returns to his childhood home um, to deal with a termite infestation. And it is set in rural Maharashtra and really encapsulates the idea of a family home in India. I think India is a place where the family home is very common, where generations live together. But as our values have started changing um, and people are sort of splintering off into nuclear families, um, a lot of these family homes are abandoned. Um, and you know it's quite a common thing that occurs there. So. Um, people sort of just leave them abandoned and these these sort of traditions kind of get lost um, in these homes and, and the film really encapsulates that, um, you know, sort of returning to this home and it's decaying and as is that tradition of growing up in a, in a family home is kind of decaying in that country as well. Kayla, when you left me on that boulevard. Yeah, so um, I guess when you left me on on that boulevard was a bit of a homecoming for me personally as a filmmaker because um, it's a little hangout movie that watches a teenage girl um, get high with her cousins and then flail around at a family Thanksgiving. So it's very much embedded um, in my idea of home and my idea of community um, because it takes place in 
mid 2000s Paradise Hills in Southeast San Diego um, in a very big Filipino American community um, that I actually left in 2007. So um, I got to shoot in my auntie's house, which is really nice. And again, just a big homecoming and a big uh, community driven project. So yeah. Let's go into how these were cast. Let's start with Shalini. Um, the casting, uh, um, it was it was a process. I think at first we knew that the main character would um, potentially attract some of, um, some actors that we might know. So we sent out the script, um, and my producer suggested a couple names, and Denzel Smith came up, uh, and he just absolutely loved the script. I think he he felt like he was the character. And funny enough, when I had my first Zoom call with him, um, it was actually quite cold. There was like a lot of distance and I wasn't quite sure about it but then I realized oh he actually is the character this is quite a like dissociated <laughs> character I was like oh that's exactly what it is um, so then I realized it was actually perfect um, <laughs> um, and and the, the, the other characters um, and actors in the film very much come from the theater space in Maharashtra so that was really great all of them um, it was their debut film yeah film experience and and it was really wonderful to sort of work with them and, and um, sort of, ch you know, work through the, comp the challenges from theater to film, so yeah. That's fantastic that it was their first time for all of them. And speaking of which, Kayla, I know you've been to Sundance before. Your films have been here. Have, have you been to film Sundance? OK, been, first yeah. times too. Can yeah, you go? First time as well. Oh, your first time. I thought I saw a film got nominated. Maybe it was a different festival. I saw. Oh, yeah, yeah. OK. <laughs> Welcome, all three of you then. Congratulations. Yes. And Liz, casting for you. Uh, you didn't have to go too far for some of the characters. Yeah, I was sort of lazy about it. But <laughs> <laughs> no, I wrote this script, and it's really sparked from my relationship with my sister, my fear for her, um, for her future. And it's written in her voice. Um, and I didn't want to, definitely didn't want to cast someone who was, you know, typical. Um, it was, it was important for me that, you know, some people say it's a, this film is like a mix of narrative and documentary because it's so personal to me. Um, my mother is also plays the mother in the film and it's in their house. Um, but I wanted to sort of use her because I think that the story is within the way that she thinks, the rhythms of her um, language. Um, I think the disability is within her body, um, and I really wanted the audience to be able to look into her eyes and listen to her. Um, so it was always going to be her, um, and then it was just about creating the space around um, the the set so I could empower her um, to be to truly react in the environment. Yeah, and then we cast um, this incredible actress Gina Yi, who has a theater background because. Um, I really wanted someone who could do repetitions and help almost be a second director. Um, and so we would often do like 20 minute shots for a tiny little scene and we would just do it on repetition and I would um, give my sister lines and she would repeat them and then I'd slowly pull back and by the end it was incredible because um, Anna would start almost summarizing the scene. She really understood the environment and and whatever she said was often more brilliant than I could ever dream. So, yeah. Tell us some more about those family dynamics, though. You shot it at your own home with your mother and your sister. Um, yeah. Give us some the, details. The set, set dressing is the home. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, and my sister, who's actually here, um, is her co-guardian. Um, and uh, we're doing educational and um, and community programming together. She has a 20 year background in education. Um, and my husband is the producer and the DP. So um, if you're related, I will let you into the world. <laughs> but it was also about creating a safe space. You know, we hired everybody. You know, there's so many talented people in the industry, but we were like, we want good humans. We want good energy here, you know, because it, it the whole film is, is created around Anna, you know? And we wanted people to understand that the rhythm of the set was gonna be based off of her. Like, she is the leader. Um, yeah. 
She definitely looked like she had fun. <laughs> yeah, I think she enjoyed being the center of attention. She definitely got on a bit of a power trip, which was awesome. Good for her, you know? <laughs> and remind us when your film premieres. Ah, uh, tomorrow night at 9 p.m., so. And Kayla, you went to social media to cast, yes. or at least help you cast. Yeah, um, it, it really mattered to me that we casted um, from, you know, hopefully the, the Paradise Hills area um, to be able to capture the specificity of the community that I wanted to, to capture. So, um, you know, if not Paradise Hills, then, you know, Southeast San Diego or Southern California. So we were really lucky to just put out like a big blast on social media, particularly Facebook and Instagram. And Instagram was really successful, thankfully. Um, I, we were found by um, our, well, who I call the cousins, the three cousins, they're my little trio. Um, I love them so much. Um, they, they found us and they were such magic. Um, we, the way that we tried to cast was that we um, started off with like having them answer like certain prompts just to understand, I guess, the bridge between them and their characters. I really wanted to see like how far the bridge was between them or if they really captured the spirit of them and um, I was lucky enough to find, you know, two actresses who grew up in Paradise Hills, actually not far from my auntie's house where we shot. Um, and then two amazing aunties. <laughs> um, one of them, uh, who I cast as Auntie Pinky, the, the really rambunctious one telling the story in the living room in that clip y'all saw. Um, and the bridge between her and Auntie Pinky was not very far, is not very long at all. She's, she's like one of my aunties, just all jam-packed into one, so very fun. <laughs> Let's talk about the cinematography, the look and the feel for the people who haven't seen the films, but they're all so distinct, but we, we felt as an audience so close to what was happening. Like Kayla, we felt like we were in that house and you could taste all the Filipino food. <laughs> but can you talk about some of the tricks that you did to, to capture that feel and describe what the feel was? Yeah, so I primarily have a, a background in photography actually, so I've always been drawn to really static frames and seeing how people move within frames. I, I also like just love comedy and humor that exists in wides. Um, and so um, I think even my, my DP, Rajani, is actually in the back over there. I thought I saw her over there. Yeah, she's amazing. Stand uh, up, stand <laughs> up, hi. <laughs> um, yeah. And she's an amazing photographer as well. And um, it, it really meant a lot to be able to, to collaborate with someone who just, you know, wasn't only like, you know, technically competent or talented, but just really understood like the feeling and, and I guess like the feeling of home that I really wanted to capture and um, the observational quality I wanted to have. So, you know, we actually just spent, I think like two or three hours around my auntie's house, just finding the frames and, and finding how like spaces were conducive to gathering, you know, figuring out where like the teenagers and the kids would hang out, figuring out where like, you know, the chismosa aunties would be gossiping and laughing and cackling together. Um, and where the uncles would be, you know, smoking and drinking and playing mahjong. So um, it was really about exploring the space and how it's conducive to gathering. And that was just a lot of fun, just finding those frames. So. And Shalini and White Ant. Um, it's, yeah, it, well, that was it, was, it was quite an experience. We decided to shoot on 16 millimeter. Um, and I think to go back to this idea of tradition and trying to evoke a sense of, of nostalgia, really, I kind of wanted to make you feel like you were smelling the house and, and almost touching it. You could smell yeah. the house. You totally <laughs> could smell the house. I'm so happy that, to hear you say that. Um, it, yeah, and I think that was, that was the purpose behind it. Um, and, and that kind of dictated everything. And again, you sort of talked about spaces and the house is so important in that film. So it was really about um, investigating and walking around the house and the space and really, in, I mean, in a way, the, the house was a character. So we did, uh, my cinematographer and me, we spent a lot of time walking around the house and just trying to inhabit it in different spaces from different points of views um, and, and then sort of situate our characters within it. Liz. Um, so my film was shot in Orlando, which was pretty important to me because I think it's a very specific place in America <laughs> and captures a lot of ideas about um, the politics in America. Um, and to me, this underlying thing about this film is also about caretaking and how um, we care for people with disabilities 
um, which I think goes across the board with mental illness and aging, um, which I think also lives in this place in Orlando. Um, but um, sort of the lighting, we were thinking about the oppressive heat <laughs> in Orlando, um, but we wanted to keep a coolness inside the house because there's something about the loneliness of this experience um, and this subject matter that's not talked about. Um, and in the frame, we sort of wanted to create this clutter. You know, there's this obvious unpacking and and of and moving on from the home, but also of the um, of the weight and the responsibility put on these two sisters. Um, so that was sort of the visual. You've all touched on this a little bit, but can we go in more into why you wanted to make these films? And Shalini, I'm particularly interested in all the weird dreams that you were having and how that ties in, whether that's pandemic related, we've all come out from a crazy few years, or where that comes from. I, th I wanted to make the film, actually for me, I really wanted to make the film because I wanted to work in India. I hadn't worked there before and I was, I'd traveled, I'd spent all my summers there, but I think as someone who grew up abroad and then would spend time in this home, you know, you're quite sheltered when you go to those spaces because you're kind of the visitor, you know, you're the cousin. <laughs> and, and you're sheltered despite, you know, belonging to that culture. And so for me, it was really important to experience India um, um, as working without the protection of my extended family. And so that was one of the main reasons. And, and also, I, I, did ex I had experienced my father returning to his home throughout the years. And, you know, he migrated to, to Chile, which was, you know, was probably as far away as he could get from India. And, um, and he just, I, I would watch him in his very detached sort of way just become more and more distant from his house and his heritage. And, and I think I just wanted to sort of explore that a little bit. I think a part of me wanted to try and understand what was going on with my father. Like, why, why are you so detached from this place? And, and in fact, every time he would go back to India, it would actually get shorter and shorter. You know, first he would go for a month and then he's like, oh, actually I actually don't need to go that long. I'll, I'll go for, you know, a week. And so there was a hesitance to, to connect, I think, with his past. Um, so I think there's a lot of it that explores past and trauma. Um, and the, the weird dreams that I was having, I think were definitely pandemic related. Um, I was waking up around two or three, I think for like almost the whole year. And I think, and that's when I wrote the script, I would wake up and sort of just write it. Um, and I think what, I'm, I mean, I felt like this happened a lot during the pandemic, a lot of sort of like, I think a lot of memories came up, a lot of discomfort came up um, because you're just sort of, you know, alone with your thoughts. And, and I think that's really where that came from, yeah. Well, it's a beautiful outcome. Yeah. Kayla, you talked, it's a return and a tribute to your family. Has your family had a chance to see it? Have you seen their reactions to it? Yeah, um, actually I got to, about like a week after we got the Sundance news, um, we flew off to San Diego to host a little uh, cast and crew and family screening, and um, I was just overjoyed to see, you know, not only my fam like my family's uh, reaction to it, but the community's reaction to it, um, and and seeing them really cling to the familiarity of the scenes and everything. So, um, my mom was a little bit horrified and asked me if I was smoking weed in high school, and. <laughs> I told her no, no, mom. <laughs> I was too scared of that stuff. So, um, yeah. yeah, it's been funny to to see the family response to it and my mother's response specifically. But <laughs> it's good to put that on the record. <laughs> <laughs> and Liz, has this film helped you with your fears? Mm. <laughs> Um, you know, it's like, I joke that this is my multitasking and, and part of like the community and education development we want to do is to, um, to work and share this story and have these conversations with people who have uh, siblings with disabilities, um, with the adoptee community. So um, it's, it's sort of a way that I keep on working and building my knowledge around this subject matter. Um, yeah, and I similarly, similarly, Lee, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, make these pieces to sort of work out my feelings and to think about the other person's perspective. And I think when I was making this script, I kept, you know, it's sort of been sitting and developing for a while. I kept wondering, I was like, ah, why am I not so into this script? Like, what, what's, why, I've seen this script before. And I realized at one point that it was because we've heard these stories about the, the, the able 
sibling's burden, um, but we don't really sit in the perspective of the disabled character, and that's what I felt was important and original about it, so. Thank you. I would like to open it up to audience questions. I have a few more and I can keep going, but if you have a question, please raise your hand. You can keep thinking about them. And again, I know it's hard to ask questions when you haven't seen the film because they're all sold out. <laughs> um, you're all ta talented, strong women. What, it has, what has it been like in the film world? Have you had uh, hardships that you want to share with the audience or any tips that you want to share with anyone in the audience that are uh, aspiring filmmakers, writers, directors? I, I don't know about working in the industry from this perspective, but I think there was a lot that I had to confront working in India, um, where usually the only female um, on a set would be the talent, and it's quite a male-dominated industry, and, and it was, I think, in a culture where it feels so vast that your space to change anything, it feels almost impossible. It's like, I can't, I can't do anything here. Um, but I think it was really important to sort of know that we could make small changes by, you know, hire, hiring more women in the crew and, and being a little bit more assertive about it and really looking for that. And it's just in a culture where it feels almost impossible to change that small, that small thing made a huge difference. And it makes a huge difference for the entire crew who are usually just, you know, you know, a room of 50 men, which feels really overwhelming. <laughs> and yeah. Um, I would just go back to say that, you know, we built this film and we um, uh, built our crew around the right human beings. <laughs> and um, this film was also supported by Julia um, and Janet Yang and Cape, which are all Asian women. And so creating this environment and having the community and being with your people made it the easiest experience possible, you know? And because I was surrounded by these supportive people, um, I think it really preserved the story, so. Um, just coming from, from film school where often, you know, like in my cinematography classes, you know, women were sitting to be the test subjects for lighting. Um, I, I guess, felt hesitant to really take the driver's seat for a while, especially after college. And so, um, and it's something I'm still learning myself. Um, and, you know, I used to think that my softness was my disadvantage or, you know, my, my sensitivity was my disadvantage. But I've, I guess I've, I really learned to reclaim that and really ask people to, you know, at least like respect my lane and, and honor that. And I think it was about like finding the right collaborative fit with people. Um, I really did find my values in the filmmaking space. Um, I'm not the loudest, I'm not the most aggressive or, you know, extroverted. And it was really nice to find people that really respected that and um, really knew how to work with that. So, um, yeah, I guess just meeting people where I'm at and meeting people where they're at, um, that was a really great experience for me as a film filmmaker. And it's really important for all of you to speak up and speak at events like this. I know you're busy running around doing a thousand different things at Sundance, but you taking the time to do that is, is very important. It's important to our organization, and we applaud Sundance for including us so we can hear more of your voices and the diverse stories that you have to tell. So thank you for, for taking time to do that. Thank you. Thank you. I'll keep looking to see if there are questions, so just jump, oh, there is one over there on the side. I think you can just go ahead and stand up and yell your question out. <laughs> Vulnerability and hesitancy to include things that were personal and a family. Who would like to kick that one off? I'll kick it off. Um, I think, so, you know, Boulevard isn't necessarily autobiographical, and there's not really a one-to-one -one of, of characters to people in my life, but I did always worry about um, people, like, finding the comparisons in themselves. Actually, like, I, at the screening, one of my cousins clocked Andy Pinky as her mom, um, which was 
I guess almost sort of true, but not completely. Um, <laughs> so that was something that I, I worried about. And again, you know, my mom being horrified at this 15 year old girl smoking weed with her cousins, um, you know, it was just <laughs> stuff like that. But um, yeah, that was, that was a slight worry, but um, I think always emphasizing that it just comes from like spiritual memory and emotional memory, um, I think has helped me conquer those fears, I guess. <laughs> I don't know that I've had any hesitance. I'm definitely hesitant to show uh, my family members the work because um, I, I'm just nervous, you know. Um, and also, I'm working on a feature which is basically based on my entire family, and and I think there's a little bit more hesitance with that. But um, I think they're I think they're um, quite flattered. Um, so so I think that that I I don't really hesitate too much, and and I think if anything, it sort of helps. I think in my particular situation, it helps my family talk about things. You know, we don't, there's so much silencing in our cultures that actually putting it on screen gets a family together to actually talk about things that, that, that maybe we wouldn't have the, the strength to talk about otherwise. Yeah, for me, I think um, it was important for me to take control of the story because um, I wanted to make sure it didn't have an outside gaze. Um, and for like instance, like I never wanted to define Anna's disability because I felt like I wanted people to lean in and listen to her and define it or for her as an authentic human being. I think for me, it was hard to balance how much I was protecting my family or my mother <laughs> on the set or in the film um, and also um, exposing what needed to be exposed for the story, like the details and the nuance. Question up here in the front. Um, thank you so much for sharing your, your, your talent and your, your personal experiences. And I was wondering, um, I sensed potentially a theme of, of some tension of disconnect between uh, your culture, but also being sort of part of it. You sort of mentioned some um, your father's kind of experience with returning home to Chile and, and Korean adoptees that you know to be globally chose not to, to focus on that aspect of their lives, and I was wondering if you could um, maybe speak to, to that tension and sort of how you incorporated them and also kind of processed it in, in your work of feeling simultaneously kind of connected and disconnected. Um, A nuanced question about being connected and disconnected at the same time. Hard one. <laughs> um, I think we're all trying to navigate that, aren't we? Like, we're, that's exactly where it's so difficult. Like, we, we're, our identities are so fractured. And I think in my work, the reason I've decided to go back to India so much recently is because that's my way of trying to figure it out. I think for first generations, there's a, almost a little bit more detachment, actually, because they sort of, you know, come to the West and there's um, more of a desire to assimilate. And I think for second generation immigrants, suddenly we are called back to our homeland and our, and our roots a little bit more. And it's almost like our generation that, that does the, the maybe the work of reconnecting um, and trying to um, fill the gap, I think. Yeah, I, that's a great question. I, th I think, yeah, it's just ingrained in who I am and how I was, how I grew up at being an adoptee. Um, uh, yeah, and I'm constantly thinking about it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't have m more to offer. Yeah, but but I guess I guess maybe I would say that like we're so on autopilot in this world, and I wonder when we are actually connecting or just talking. <laughs> um, so I think that's a theme in all of my work. Like, what are those real human moments where we really understand someone beyond language? Yeah. Um, I guess part of the disconnect for me came from, uh, you know, I, I left Paradise Hills in 2007 um, at the age of 15 and suddenly went to the suburbs of Katy, Texas, um, which was quite the whiplash. Um, and so going back to San Diego and going back to my community, I did feel a sense of, of fear and insecurity that I wasn't qualified to tell this story. Um, but honestly, just, just going out there on a limb and, and you know, asking people to join me in this, it was actually really easy um, and really validating to see that people you know, wanted me to, to work alongside them to tell a story about the community. So 
um, I guess just surrounding myself with community and, and letting people tell me that they believed in me and letting me receive that, um, that, that made things better, so. <laughs> Getting down to the last couple of questions probably, talk about shorts. Our team after we watched these, it was like six or seven, and it was an emotional roller coaster. All of your films are short, but you pull us in and they're tears and it's emotional. For the non-filmmakers in the room, tell us about your process and perhaps the future of shorts. We're in a short attention span society with TikTok and all of that. What's the future? <laughs> I'll take this one, guys. <laughs> um, I mean, I would say this, for me, this is a proof of concept for a feature. So it was to try things out. It was to prove also that Anna could hold a movie and people would follow her and be engaged. Um, and to me also, I love shorts because it can just be an idea and a moment and it lets things linger with the audience and lets them be curious. Um, so that's, I think, the beauty of it, just letting it stand as a transitional moment and having people create their own uh, conversation out of it. I have a hard time with shorts. Um, I, I, I'm hesitant to make them. Um, I just, I have a hard time, and I think that's why I decided for White Ant to be a little bit more experiential rather than, than trying to get into a character and a narrative and then you know leaving them before you know you even get to know them that well so i think it's 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 quite a challenge to ask an audience to to really get to know someone in such a short span of time um so i personally feel like um you know shorts should um or or, or can be more experiential and i just i i personally like shorts that are like quite bonkers and just take you in weird places yeah same, honestly. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I really love the short filmmaking space, and um, with with my attention span, I always usually gravitate towards shorts. Like I'm at, I'm trying to watch all the shorts programs here at Sundance, which is really I'm really excited about that. Um, I will say, as as far as the future for shorts, um, I hope that there are more like distribution avenues and I guess more support for shorts because I think it's a very underappreciated and very underrated medium that's very challenging to create in and um, trying to create something so engaging and concise. Um, so I just want to give props to, to all the short filmmakers out there and hope that we continue to get more support as we keep making more movies. Okay, last rapid fire question. Three words to describe your Sundance experience since it's the first time for all of you to be here. Just three words, three words. We'll give them some time to think. It's supposed to be rapid fire. Fun, it's been fun. Fun, it's been, okay. I mean, obviously cold. cold yeah. yeah, very confusing. <laughs> I'm still confused. Um, okay, Kayla. <laughs> Sleepy, dehydrated. Dry. Dry, yeah, dry. dry yeah. I have eczema, so this has been Thank hard. you very, very much. <laughs> Thank you. I do want to thank everybody in the audience for joining us. This is the fifth time we've been at Sundance. Again, thank you to the Sundance team. Thank you to Julia, to Josh, and to Harbor, and to Southwest. Thanks to our team. And also, we do have fortune cookies that are specially made from Fremont as well, but also from Asia Society. They're made from the Oakland Fortune Cookie Factory. It's the oldest uh, factory in the Bay Area, so please enjoy them on your way out, and happy Lunar New Year.